now, can you? Better? OK, now here, there we go. I want to say that it's such an honor to be up here talking to this particular group. Over 20 years ago, I was at the Promega meetings in Scottsdale. I was sitting in these seats that you guys are seated, are seated in now. Um, I have 40 minutes in which I'm going to be talking about a case that I've spent my entire career being involved with. Um, and it's a case that, uh, as I go through it, I think you'll understand why I became so committed and persistent on trying to pursue. Because, as Bill said, this is a very unusual offender. Visalia Ransacker, East Area Rapist, original Night Stalker, and finally Golden State Killer, all those monikers are applied to this series. How did I initially get involved in this series? Well, believe it or not, I got involved because of DNA. In the mid-90s, I was a handful of years into my forensic science career, and after having worked in several forensic science disciplines, I was assigned to the serology unit doing ABO, absorption inhibition, absorption elution. I can't tell you how many how much DNA I consumed trying to get those perfect Takayama crystals. 1994, I run across a file cabinet tucked away in the corner of the laboratory's library. And inside that cabinet were manila folders labeled with a red EAR, East Area Rapist. I was just coming off reading a book called Sexual Homicide, and I was fascinated with serial predators. And I said, hell, here's a, here appears to be an unsolved serial predator case, but at the time thought it was well past statute of limitations. I thought, well, let's see what I can do with it, because we've got this newfangled DNA technology coming in. And it just turns out that my sheriff's office was the only agency in Northern California that had kept the evidence from the East Area Rapist attacks and I was able to get three sexual assault kits and get a DNA profile from those three kits using the DQ Alpha polymarker system that you see up there. I ended up doing sort of a telephonic investigation after talking to, with one of the original investigators who told me, hey, we thought our guy, after he had attacked in Northern California, 50 attacks in Northern California, we thought he went down to Santa Barbara, maybe, maybe killed somebody down there. So I call Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara says, no, we don't have anything related to your series. But you know what? Irvine PD has something they're doing with DNA. Talk to them. I talked with an investigator at Irvine PD who said, you know what? Mary Hong at the Orange County Sheriff's Office has DNA on two of our homicide cases that match each other. So I call Mary up. And we talk. I've got my DQA1 polymarker profile. She had DQA1 and CTT. They were a little bit more advanced. They had started STRs. And this is now circa 1997. Our DQ Alpha matched, but what does that mean? And I told Mary, you know what? When we get STRs on board, I'll circle back around. It took us four years in order to get STRs on board. 2001, I had promoted up. This case was still on my mind. I assigned it to a DNA analyst, Dave Stockwell. Some of you might know him. He does STR on those three cases. Those profiles match across those three cases. And I said, hey, I talked with Mary Hong four years ago. You know what? Just out of due diligence, give her a call. You know, we share DQ Alpha, but the likelihood of it sharing across STRs is probably minimal. But let's just follow through. He calls Mary. They literally read the STR profile to each other. So now, Dave, being understated, comes into my office and says, yeah, it matched. And I'm like, right? So I'm in a big scramble, and that's when I initially contact Larry Poole, who's the Orange County Sheriff's uh, investigator, and basically said, what can I do to help you? And he's telling me now, it's more than two cases. I've got, I think, six cases with 10 homicide victims. And we know this guy is the original Night Stalker. And so I fed Larry Poole everything I had just to support his homicide investigation. And that really was kind of what I thought was going to be the end of my involvement in this case. Pay attention to this date here, April 4th, 
2001. That's when it went public that the East Area Rapist attacks had been connected to the homicides down in Southern California. The reason this date is important, and this is a tease as to who the Golden State Killer is from a, a psychological standpoint, the day after this went public, one of the victims out of Sacramento, 24 years after she had been attacked, receives a phone call. Golden State Killer called her up and said, remember when we played, and hangs up. So, let's start talking about this series. And I'm gonna have to move quick. There's so much content here, so if it seems like I'm rushed, I, I apologize, but I wanna get through this. Down in Visalia, we had the Visalia Ransacker series. Over 100 fetish bergs were going on. A guy's going into houses. He's spreading women's undergarments all over the place. He's breaking piggy banks and, and, and taking coins. He's purposely taking these blue, uh, blue chip stamps, something you could turn in to get these, these items at, at local stores. At one point during the series, he tries to pull 16-year-old Beth Snelling out of her bed. And as he's fighting with her, her father hears this and tries to come to her rescue. Visalia Ransacker drops Beth, pulls out a gun, shoots and kills Claude Snelling. These Fetishbergs continue after that until Officer McGowan comes face to face with the Ransacker at night as he's about to enter the backyard. The Ransacker pulls a gun and shoots Officer McGowan. Fortunately, the bullet hits McGowan's flashlight. At this point, we have no other ransacker attacks down in Visalia. When you take a look at the distribution pattern of all the burglaries, you can see the volume of cases that Visalia was dealing with. The red pin indicates where the homicide occurred. At this point in time, we know that D'Angelo was the Visalia ransacker. D'Angelo had recently be, been hired by the Exeter Police Department. And so he's working in the, the town right next to Visalia. But the pattern of these burglaries surround the College of the Sequoias. D'Angelo attended the police academy at that college. Irony of ironies. D'Angelo, while an Exeter police officer, was assigned to a burglary task force. With taxpayer money, D'Angelo learned how to become a better burglar and a better offender. And quite frankly, as a Visalia ransacker, he was not very good. He was seen by many people. But when he moves on, he becomes very good at what he did. The composite, which I always thought looked clownish, turns out was pretty close to what Joe looked like back in 1974-75. June 1976, Visalia hasn't had an attack for six months. Sacramento, gets its first East Area Rapist attack. And over the course of the next three years, we end up having 50 attacks that are distributed across Northern California. And so I've broken this series down into four phases. And with phase one, we've got the Sacramento Stockton series, where now we have a very athletic and trim looking individual breaking into houses in the middle of the night. And one of the things that uh, is my big miss in this series from an investigative standpoint is I did not think the Visalia Ransacker and the East Area Rapist were the same person. In part because the Visalia Ransacker was described as being very heavy, thick through the hips, thick thigh, you know, fat faced. And the East Area Rapist, and in particular the first two attacks six months after the Visalia Ransacker was last seen, shows up nude from the waist down. So the vic those victims actually saw the stereo rapist 
head to toe, and he was very fit, very athletic looking. I was like, these are two different individuals. Turns out I was wrong. And at this point in time, D'Angelo, I believe, learned his lesson down in Visalia. And not only did he improve his skills, and I'll underscore that as I go through and talk about this, but he recognized that that composite was too close to what he looked like. And he purposely altered his appearance, but still wanted to offend up in the Sacramento area. I'm going to break the attacks down into two different types. When there's only a, an adult female in the house, and then when there's a male in the house. When there's an adult female, the East Area Rapist would immediately go in, go hands on, get the female bound in her bed, and then go through the house looking for the items, typically jewelry and cash, and then come back and sexually assault her, oftentimes repeatedly sexually assaulting her. Very terrorizing. He always wore a mask and he talked through clenched teeth. And he's just saying, do what I say or I'll kill you. Always that constant threat. When there's a man present, there was a newspaper article that came out that said he never attacks when there's a man home. So what does he do? He now goes in and attacks a couple. And with men, he changes his MO because now he's got the bigger threat and he goes, he'll go into the house in the middle of the night, the couple's asleep, he'll wake them up, but he doesn't go hands on. He stands at the foot of the bed, close to an exit point, it wakes them up, he still has a mask on, but he's shining a flashlight in their eyes, blinding them. And again, through clenched teeth, he's now ordering them, you do what I say or I'll kill you. I've got a gun, I've got a 357, I'll spatter your brains all over the wall and he'll put the gun in front of the flashlight in order to let the couple know he did have that weapon. Ordered the husband face down or the boyfriend face down. He threw bindings to the female, made her bind her husband up. And then he would go and bind the female and then go back and double check the bindings on the male. Go through the house, ransacking it, and then would grab dishes or similar items and come back and put those on the back of the male as an alarm system and told the male, if I hear these, she's dead or I'll cut a part of her off. I'll kill everything in this house if there were kids asleep in their rooms. And then he'd take the woman out to the, uh, the family room and that's where he would sexually assault them. Very early on in the series, he is literally crisscrossing the Sacramento area. He is showing broad familiarity from a geographic profile standpoint. After 22 attacks, he's, he's down in Stockton, and he goes back up, does six more attacks, and is back down in Stockton. We have a very strong cluster in Rancho Cordova, which was always very interesting and a focus of my investigation. And D'Angelo, as a boy, ended up, let me see if I can go back as a boy, attended the middle school nearby. This was basically his neighborhood that he became familiar with. So when he moves back up to the Sacramento area, he's now attacking initially in a neighborhood that he knows and is familiar. After he starts attacking with men present, 50% of his attacks have men present. He is purposefully attacking with a man there. This is an unusual aspect about this serial predator. In this particular case, case 25, not only is he very denigrating in terms of the verbiage he's using to the male, he ends up taking the man's uh, baseball cap for his concrete company. He took a souvenir of this man. And I believe this couple and other couples were targeted based on who the man was. I don't know which ones for sure. But I guarantee that with, with, with uh, the Golden State Killer, he is selecting some of his victims based on who the man was. He had a previous interaction and said, I will come back and show you who I am. Myself and Lieutenant Kirk Campbell went, just before we solved this case, about six months before we solved this case, I actually went and re-interviewed this male victim. And this male victim said, after that attack, I'm out at a job site. And I had this curb forming machine that I would use for the concrete work. And on that machine, a piece of twine had been laid on it. 
and that piece of twine matched the, the bindings that had been applied to him and his wife. And he said there is no source of that twine anywhere at that job site. That guy came back to send me a message. The other interesting thing he said, he goes, you know, his voice sounded familiar. It sounded like an a, a Italian developer I know. Okay, turns out that kind of matched up with who D'Angelo ultimately was. Take a look at a uh, crime scene. This is, this is in Stockton. Uh, turns out he went into the master uh, bedroom through the uh, rear sliding door. And he often would disable the, the old landlines, the phones, in the house. In the very first attack, he tried to cut the phone lines entering into the house. Uh, in this particular case, the victims had a phone out by the pool. All he had to do was take the phone off the hook, and basically he renders that phone system dead. They couldn't call out once he left. In many of the cases, he ended up, uh, once the victims were bound, he would go through their refrigerator, grab several cans of Coors Light or soda, uh, grab a box of crackers and, and be out in the backyard eating while the victims are inside bound up. He often uh, brought his own bindings, but once the victims were initially bound, he would go into their closets and take shoelaces out of their shoes and put more bindings on them to make sure, particularly the male, make sure that the male was completely secure. Typically what you see in these cases is you see the, the, the dishes uh, that were used as an alarm system. And these victims would frequently have to try to get out of the bindings in order just to be able to call uh, the operator. This is in the days before 911. But he also went through and ransacked looking for that jewelry and cash, as you can see. Of note, out in the family room, and this is a typical thing, he would have the woman laying here bound. In this particular case, he put dishes on the woman. He did that in a few other cases as well. But one of his things that he liked to do is he, in the middle of the night, he would turn the TV on and put it on the station with just the static, turn the volume all the way down, and then drape a towel over the TV so he had that soft glow so he could see the victim's fear on her face as he's sexually assaulting her. When I walked into D'Angelo's room after he's arrested, he had a computer monitor set up, and he had a towel draped over that computer monitor. To this day, he was still reliving the fantasies of when he was attacking these women. He set his room up to be able to basically replicate what he experienced back in the 1970s. February of 1978, we got Brian and Katie Maggiore wandering around that very neighborhood where we have the strongest cluster of East Area Rapist attacks. It appears, Brian is a military police officer, and it appears that they run across the East Area Rapist as he's out prowling. And Brian gives chase and ultimately corners the offender at a fence in a rear yard. The offender pulls a gun, shoots and kills Brian, and then chases Katie down, shoots her in the top of the head, kills her, and then runs off. We actually have witnesses that see the offender both doing, committing the, the, the homicide as well as along the escape. And also we have a composite that comes out. There's two men that were seen walking. One man with the mustache is probably identified as somebody else, but it's very possible that the plain face man the, uh, is, was close enough in terms of appearance to match D'Angelo. We don't have another Sacramento-based attack. We have one down in South Sacramento, but the East Area Rapist moves on from Sacramento after this double homicide. And he goes into what, I, what I've labeled as phase two, where he's literally toggling between Modesto and Davis, California. Modesto is about a two-hour drive south of Sacramento. Davis is 110 driving miles away from Modesto. He attacks a couple down in Modesto, and then two days later, he's up in Davis attacking a single uh, co-ed, UC Davis student. Week goes by, a couple weeks go by, he's back down attacking a couple in Modesto, and within 22 hours, he's up attacking another couple in Davis. And then a week goes by, January 6, 1978, he attacks another, a female in Davis, and then that's the 
the end of this particular phase. With that last attack in Davis, as he is literally raping the woman, he is sobbing and he's saying, I hate you, Bonnie, I hate you, Bonnie, over and over again. So we always knew that our offender had a woman in his life, probably named Bonnie, that was significant to him. It could have been mom, it could have been a wife, could have been a girlfriend, don't know. But that was something. As we're looking at D'Angelo, before we knew he was our guy, one of the bits of information that we ran across was a 1970 uh, article about his engagement to a Bonnie. So that was one of those little check marks about D'Angelo that seemed to start adding up as we were assessing him as possibly being the Golden State Killer. Remember in Visalia, I didn't think he was very good as a burglar. As East Area Rapist, he was elite. And that last attack demonstrated that. That woman had everything. Her, her doors, windows were all locked, and all the windows had wood dowels in the tracks. He ended up punching a hole in the window, and using a tool, he was able to unlock the window, and then using some other tool, he was able to fish the wood dowel out of the track and silently enter that house. That's not the only time he did that, down in my area in Concord. He initially tries to get in to the house through a side garage door, but there's a security bar blocking that door from being open. So he goes to the front of the house, goes to plan B, and punches a hole in the window and ends up unlocking it, climbs through the window, puts the screen back on the window, and shuts it. And this shows a level of sophistication because that that window faced a prime road. And you could see he had concerns about if the window screen was seen off and that window open, a patrol unit driving around would possibly stop and check. So even under duress and having to resort to plan B, he is thinking ahead. It's showing a level of sophistication. Down in San Jose, you know, I've used these, these little you know, screw track that you, you put, you screw, screw locks that you put on the window track. He just punched a hole through the window and pried it off. Basically, it shows that he would get into that house any way he possibly could, and he's showing that he is targeting select, in, select victims. He's not just wandering through a neighborhood looking for an open door and happen to go in. There's something about the victims that caused him to take these measures to go into that house versus going into another place that's an easier uh, access. Ended up really taking a look at all these statements that he was making, and he is doing what I call verbal staging. He's feeding the misdirecting statements to the victims, knowing it would get back to law enforcement. And in part, you'll see him say something like, uh, you know, don't make any sudden moves, lay still, I'll kill you, kill you like I did some people in Bakersfield. But then after that, he says, I've never killed before, but I'm going to kill now. So he's contradicting himself. He can't keep his story straight. And so that gives insight into, okay, what he is saying is, is he's, he's trying to misdirect because he knows the victims are going to talk to law enforcement. So you start taking a look at his statements going, well, he's trying to set him, himself up as this kind of drug-addicted, semi-transient uh, sex deviant as he's wandering around the countryside. Well, if he's trying to set himself up that way, then he's something different. And so I started saying he is a much more probably uh, uh, successful individual in his personal life than what we originally thought. And then evaluating some of his statements now that we know about D'Angelo, you know, when I was in the Army or I was discharged from the Army, you know, I initially took that, well, he was never in the military. Well, it turns out D'Angelo's in the military, but he was a Navy guy. And where's the big thing with Navy Army, right? Um, with one victim, when her husband was gone and he's asking, where's your husband? She said, he's up in Roseville. And he, his response was, well, where's Roseville? It's like, oh, come on, you know where Roseville is. Well, D'Angelo was an intern for Roseville PD at one point in his life. So again, he's trying to misdirect. Phase three, down in the East Bay, he's now attacking, starting in October of 1978, along the I-680 corridor from Concord all the way down to San Jose. 
And in essence, it's a linear driving pattern. It doesn't show that crisscrossing that we saw in phase one up in Sacramento. He's not showing the broad familiarity of the, the region. And so I always said he never moved down to the East Bay. He's coming up out of Sacramento. He's coming down from Sacramento. And it turns out I was correct about that. He was actually living up in Auburn at the time. Here's a photograph, D'Angelo. June 1979, he had just attacked for the second to last time in Northern California. So now this photograph shows me exactly what D'Angelo looked like for that particular attack. And yet he's back up in Auburn as a police officer at this uh, little charity event with uh, the kids at the baseball field. A Little bit later, a month goes by and then he is arrested for shoplifting. So here you've got an Auburn police officer that's down in Citrus Heights and he's trying to shoplift dog repellent and a hammer. Why? Why is he taking those particular items? After that, he ends up being put on admin leave by Auburn Police Department and then ultimately terminated. We have no other tax in Northern California that we know of after that uh, arrest and that termination. But now, that's when we start seeing the attacks down in Southern California. This is the original Night Stalker phase. And the first attack in October of 1979 is a identical East Area Rapist attack. He goes in, separates the, the woman from the man, the man's bound in the bed. But in this particular attack, while the woman's laying in the front room, Golden State Killer is pacing back and forth and he's saying, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him this time. This causes the woman to freak out. She gets up, she tries to run to the front door, but she's been blindfolded. He goes after her, she lets out a big scream. The man hears that, he gets up, he's bound, he hops out the, 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 the sliding door, lost control. The offender has lost control. He runs out and the neighbor was an uh, off-duty FBI agent who heard that commotion, grabs his gun, runs out to the front to see the Golden State Killer on a bicycle ride right past him. FBI agent goes and gets in his car, gives chase, catches up to the man on the bike. Offender ends up dumping the bike, hops fences, and disappears. Two months go by, December. 1979, end of December 1979, we have a double homicide. Dr. Offerman, Dr. Manning, and they are found shot inside uh, Offerman's bedroom. And Offerman has been shot multiple times. It appears that he had slipped his bindings and tried to charge, make a charge at the offender. And as soon as he stood up to run at the offender, he ends up catching a bullet in his neck. And then he ends up getting shot the Golden State Killer is able to track him with the gun and kills him and then goes over and shoots Deborah Manning in the back of her head while she's laying bound face down in the bed. Three months go by, down in Ventura. Lyman and Charlene Smith are found bludgeoned to death inside, on, on their bed inside uh, the, the room. In this particular case, the offender there was actually three cases that had gone sideways. There was one that was up in Northern California, his very last attack, where the male had gotten up and confronted him, and basically he ended up having to run out. Then we had the, uh, the attack in Santa Barbara that went sideways, and then we had Dr. Offerman try to charge at him, and he had to do this defensive kill with the gun to take out Dr. Offerman. This case goes exactly how he wants it, and this is what I've kind of referred to as his opus. He was able to get the couple bound. He's able to sexually assault uh, Charlene, and then he bludgeons them, and that's what he wants to do. That is his preferred method of killing, is bludgeoning. It is this case in which we got the DNA to be able to do the genealogy, and I'll be talking about that in, in a little bit. Six months go by, and now in a gated community down in Laguna Niguel, we've got Keith and Patrice Harrington bludgeoned to death in their bed. This case is the one that uh, 
ended up having a huge impact on California's uh, DNA database because Brother Bruce, an attorney, helped fund uh, Prop 69 because he wanted to catch whoever killed his brother and uh, brother's wife. So this case has had multiple impacts on the criminal justice system over time. Another six months go by, we have a single female, Manuela Whitun, up in Irvine, uh, bludgeoned to death. And then in July of 1981, back up in the Santa Barbara area, we have Gregory Sanchez and, um, and Sherry Domingo ended up being killed. Gregory Sanchez appears to have gone face to face with the offender when he first walks in, gets shot in the left cheek, bullet exits out the back of his, uh, behind his ear, but it's a non-fatal wound, never penetrates the skull, but he goes down, killer goes up, gets uh, uh, the female bound face down on the bed, and then Gregory reanimates, and now the killer has to go and interact with Gregory multiple times. Um, he ends up bludgeoning Gregory to death and then goes over and bloods Sherry Domingo to death and something spooks him in this case and literally as he's escaping he is dumping bindings as he's running out of the house and running down to the creek area in, in Santa Barbara near where the attacks occurred. We don't have another known case after this, this, uh, this attack for five years and then May 1986, again in Irvine, we have pretty little Janelle Cruz found bludgeoned to death in her bed. She was home alone, and for whatever reason, uh, the, uh, the offender selected her and committed this last attack. This is the last known attack attributed to the Golden State Killer. Five of the six homicide cases down in Southern California are all linked with DNA. We don't have DNA in the, the Offerman Manning case. And then the three cases that I had up in uh, Contra Costa County are linked to those five cases. So across, across uh, California, we've got that DNA match across multiple cases. Around uh, late 2000s, uh, 2009, 2010, I really got heavily involved in just now active investigation where I'm going out and I'm talking to the victims, I'm, I'm tracking down suspects. And this is just to illustrate my failings as I've investigated this case. I thought I had a guy that one of the original investigators had confronted back in 1979. And he was an amazing suspect. I could put him in all the areas in Northern California. He lawyered up all sorts of stuff and disappeared in 2004 after Prop 69 was, was implemented. So I thought he's purposefully avoiding getting his DNA collected. I spent two years looking for him. Ultimately, he's found he had become homeless and had assumed his brother's identity. Sack Sheriff's Office goes, they interview him, they get his DNA, and I thought, I've got this case solved and then I got the elimination. After two years of my life looking for this guy, I was crushed. How did I screw up? And this is where I started assessing what I did. And I basically took a suspect and made him fit. And if you ever have the time, I strongly recommend reading Dr. Kim Rosmo's Criminal Investigative Failures because that's exactly what you don't want to do. This case is so huge I picked details from all these cases in order to support that individual as the suspect. So now I recalibrate, said I have to be evidence-based, and I use that in quotes because, of course, DNA is always there. DNA has been up in CODIS since 2001 on this series. So I assessed all the evidence in the, 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 uh, the case, and there was this diagram dropped after one of the attacks that I to this day still think is probably from the Golden State Killer. And it was such a unique diagram that I thought it would help lead me to who this, the killer was. So I started pursuing this evidence-based investigative tactic. And then ultimately, and I'm looking at all sorts of guys, but my last and best prime suspect, right here, the guy's ex-wife gave me this photograph. Um, he, I found him in Davis. I was looking, investigating the cases in Davis. I ran across his name. He was a builder, which fit 
the type of occupation that would be involved in drawing such a diagram. At the time of the East Area Rapist attacks, he lived in the heart of that strong cluster in Rancho Cordova. When he moved to Davis, that's when I have the Davis attacks occurring. And when I go and I interview his ex-wife, she said in June of 1976, I caught him. I came home late, the house is dark, I go inside, it's like, what's he doing? I know he's been peeping on high school girls that live next door. I turn on uh, the, the backyard lights and I find my husband coming down through my backyard nude. He's been out prowling in the nude in the very neighborhood at the very same time that the East Area Rapist shows up nude from the waist down. I thought, I've got the guy. He's got to be the offender in this case. The FBI helps me out. We get a DNA sample, and he's eliminated. And this is where I'm now questioning, are you sure you got the right sample? I'm sure all of you have talked to investigators, and after you said, nope, he's not the guy, and they say, are you sure? Did you do the, do the DNA right? You know, I was now in that position going, it's got to be him. I don't believe the DNA. It's got to be him. This was where I was at my just lowest. And then I had the fortuitous conference call on a different case, not anything related to Golden State Killer. And it was with a, a San Bernardino a detective, Peter Headley. And he had identified this girl um, that we had been trying to identify for 15 years uh, using traditional you know, techniques. And I said, well, how did you do that? And he said, well, I, I used DNAadoption.com, and I was working with uh, Dr. Barbara Ray Venter. Oh, OK. So I end up communicating with Barbara. And I know Barbara's in the audience. And I was like, hey, would this work with an unknown offender? And she was like, well, I don't see why it wouldn't. At the same time, FBI uh, LA general counsel Steve Kramer called me up. He had heard that I was pursuing DNA and genealogy stuff and said, I believe in what you're doing. How can I help? And this is how we ended up drilling down on this investigative genealogy or forensic genealogy or whatever we're going to call it moving forward. And we ended up forming this small team that uh, Barbara was our advisor, Steve, myself. We had Melissa Parasot, uh, an analyst that worked with Steve. And then I pulled in Lieutenant Kirk Campbell and investigative assistant Monica Tchaikowski. And we started doing, under Barbara's guidance, this initial genealogy and building the family trees based on the SNP testing that we had received. And I know that there's multiple talks about how this technique works. I'm not going to get into that. But I will underscore that this case 44 years of law enforcement investigation, all sorts of investigators, more resources than probably any other case in California history, had failed to solve who the Golden State Killer was. It took us, the small team, four months. And it was, it was a long four months. But once we kind of drilled down to a small suspect pool, and I'm now doing, and I've invest, I'm investigating these individuals, and we had eliminated some of the individuals, and quite frankly, one that I thought was a better candidate than D'Angelo. Once we eliminated him, I said, like, well, I've got this Auburn police cop. I mean, I, I couldn't believe a full-time officer could be doing all these attacks all over Northern California while he's working for Auburn PD. I said, I've got to take a look at this guy. And I ended up reaching out to Bonnie. She had been out of the country, so I left her a message. I never did talk to her ahead of time. But then I called the police chief that fired him and didn't even tell him what case I was working and just said, hey, do you remember this Joe DeAndre? He goes, oh, yeah, I remember Joe. I was his sergeant at one point, you know, and I fired him, and he tells me the story about the termination. And he said, after I put him on admin leave, and this is what caused me to zero in on DeAngelo, he goes, Paul, I was sleeping in my bed. And my teenage daughter comes into my room and says, Daddy, there's a man standing outside my window shining a light in. And so Pete gets up and runs outside. The man is gone, but there's fresh shoe impressions all around his backyard, around the perimeter of his house. And at that point, I'm going, and he goes, 
I know that was D'Angelo. At that point, I was like, okay, that's exactly how I thought, would think the Golden State Killer would respond to being terminated by this man. So that's when I drive up and I start taking a look at D'Angelo, um, and I'm retiring. Yeah, I literally, my last day is I drove up uh, and parked in front of D'Angelo's house going, is it him, is it not? Maybe I should just knock on the door and say, hey, I'm Paul Holes, you know, your name has come up, uh, let, let's chat, and do you mind giving me a, a DNA sample? And then I was just like, you know, there's just enough about him that I wasn't confident that he was not the guy, you know? It was just like, nah, I, I can't do that. And so I drove off, turned my badge and gun in the next day, turned in my FBI credentials, but continued working the genealogy and enough built up on D'Angelo to where the FBI and Sachs Sheriff put him under surveillance. They got a surreptitious sample. They actually got two surreptitious samples, and that all obviously came back and matched to D'Angelo. <clears throat> One of the things that I recently found out is that when I retired in March, so did Joe. We retired at, both retired at the end of March, and I would say that my retirement has gone a little bit differently than his. After a couple months after the whirlwind, I ended up finally got a break and sat down and just kind of reflected on things. This is him sitting in the interview room, absolutely crushed. He never thought this day was going to come. But when you take a look at the devastation that that man wrecked across California and the types of crimes that he committed, the brazenness of the crimes that he committed, it's a good thing that this investigative genealogy technique came when it did. I wish we had it back in 1974 because all these people would still be alive. But this group right here, everybody, there's been so much contributions over the decades towards forensic DNA that everything that was applied to this case is built on what everybody in this room has done prior. And then we're seeing all these other cases across the nation being solved using the, the, this new tool. So I can say that, you know, I'm very proud of having worked with uh, Barbara Ray Venter, with Steve Kramer, with Kirk, with Melissa, and everybody else involved with the Golden State Killer investigation, because this was truly a team effort. And at this point, I'll go ahead and, and take some questions, uh, if you have any questions, and then turn it back over to the uh, moderator. have um, access to your questions. Uh, my question is, um, with regards to any victim impact statements, are there any that jump out at you? Uh, you, you know, with, uh, with the Golden State Killer, where we're at right now is, is the SAC DA's office is marching down towards a preliminary hearing. We have victims that are uh, routinely coming from across the country to show up for court. They haven't had an opportunity to make any impact statements technically in court but they want to see justice. They, they, to this day, are still traumatized by this man, and they want to get their day in court to where they can confront him face to face. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I heard, uh, do we have any insight on how he's targeting his victims? So that's my big question. At this point in time, we have no information on how he selected his victims. And quite frankly, my assessment is, is he most likely was multimodal in his victim selection. I think some of these women he probably saw and followed home. I think other victims, he's in a neighborhood doing his burglaries and he literally runs across somebody that's a victim of opportunity. As I mentioned, I think there are men that were targeted, and it may have been as simple as in the uh, grocery store, he bumps shoulders with a guy and gets upset at him, and basically is like, okay, I'll show you who I am. But at this point, we don't know if he had any prior relationship with any of his victims. 
We had a question come in. What was it like working with a reporter for the big like McNamara and walking her through the case, including ride-alongs? What did you think of her coverage of the cases and media coverage overall? Yeah, so Michelle McNamara was a true crime blogger that wrote a Los Angeles Magazine article, and she was the one that changed the moniker from ear ons, which nobody knew what that meant, to the Golden State Killer. And that's when the public really started to glom onto this series. Michelle uh, proved to be a very bright mind and capable investigator with a heart of gold. Um, you know, I, I won't go, it, it's a, I got a, into a very close relationship with, Mel, with Michelle and she tragically passed away in her sleep. Um, but she wrote the book, I'll Be Gone, and uh, she covers her investigation and how this case impacts her in that book. And another question was, what advice do you have for people here about how to work with reporters and media? Any advice for media covering these cases? You know, obviously I've, I've been interviewed a lot for this case, um, and the reality is, is that all these reporters that I have interacted with, these journalists, have been very upfront uh, with their intentions and what they're reporting, and I would say that when you sit down and you're talking to these reporters, you need to be upfront with them in terms of, hey, this is what I can say, this is what I can't say. Um, everybody that I've dealt with, when you start talking about off-the-record information, uh, they have stuck to that. And so, for the most part, I think honesty is the best approach. I've never shied away from the media. I think that they assist with public safety. Um, just make sure you know what you can and can't say per your agency uh, and your agency's policy and be upfront with uh, the people you're talking to about where they can go with their questions and where they can't. Why do you think he stopped? So I personally think that psychologically he stopped after he had that interaction with Gregory Sanchez. We don't have another attack for five years. I think he ran out of that house, house scared. He got into a physical fight with six foot three Gregory Sanchez and was like, I think at this point the Golden State Killer is going, I'm done. I could have been caught. I could have been killed. I don't want to do this. And then five years later, he runs across Janelle Cruz and can't help himself. But we have nothing after that 1986 case. At this point, D'Angelo's 41 years old, which is old for a serial predator, particularly one that requires such a physically demanding type of crime. I just think he ended up going, I'm no longer doing it. Very similar to BTK and Dennis, Dennis Rader. And someone else wants to know that they know that you're retired, but did you ever have an opportunity to interview him? No, so uh, when, when he's arrested and he's in the interview room, uh, Ken Clark and I, I helped uh, write the arrest warrant as well as the search warrant, and then we had developed a strategy. Ken was going to go in, into uh, the interview to talk about the SAC cases first to try to get statements related to the Maggiore double homicide. And then I and Ken were going to talk about the Central Valley and East Bay cases because those were the ones that I knew real well and I had spent most of the time investigating. But the way that D'Angelo responded in the interview, and I can't go into details, caused us to have to get homicide investigators from Southern California in front of him before I got the opportunity. So I did not get a chance to talk to him as, a, as an interviewer during that. I hope someday to talk to him. Another question was, has he openly talked about things or has he admitted to anything? And, and that is what I cannot get into, just because of the legalities <laughs> of what's going on. Um, let's just say that I wish I had more information about what's going on inside his brain. And one final question. What do you anticipate for the future of this technology? Well, I think, you know, when, when this team ended up employing this technology. You know, we recognized the power of it, but I had no, um, I really did not think that I would see what we've seen since the Golden State Killer was caught using this technology. I don't know what the numbers are. I think it's far, it's in excess of 70 cases, cold cases, that have been solved using this technology. And when you take a look at the types of cases being solved, 
They're the most horrific types of crimes imaginable. And in many of these cases, they're, they're cases in which the agencies were at a complete loss as to where they could go investigatively or forensically to try to solve the case. And just like D'Angelo, when we sat down as a group and just kind of debriefed uh, D'Angelo, we recognized that after 44 years, realistically, we weren't even close to identifying him as the Golden State Killer. And I think these other cases that have been solved using this tool, it's the same thing that they've experienced. These, this guy never came on their radar. So I think right now we are in this, you know, kind of this uh, intermediate era of this revolutionary tool being applied. And as we move forward, I think this tool is going to settle into uh, sort of a, a quality assurance uh, and um, kind of a standardized approach on how it should be employed, what kinds of cases it will be employed with. And I know for me, I'm going to continue to champion the continued use of this tool because I know there is a societal debate about you know, privacy concerns and everything else. And that's where we want to make sure that law enforcement does not misuse it. Well, and I think that in 30 years when we look down at our forensic feet, that we're going to see a path laid today by this enormous, tremendous, inexorably decisive group. Thank you so much, Detective Holes. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.